Hi, my name is Bud Hunt. I'm an instructional technology coordinator in the St. Rain Valley School District in Northern Colorado. And I want to share with you today for the K-12 online conference some ideas that we're thinking about and how they relate to learning. We call this presentation Make Hack Play, Lenses for Learning. In a minute, I want to define these terms for you and uh, help you to think about how we're thinking about ways that uh, these, these ideas can be lenses for uh, our classrooms and our professional development spaces. But, but first, I need to tell you a story. Um, it was about three years ago that I was invited to attend a, an event with the National Writing Project called the Digital Is Conference. Um, during that day, we, we spent some time uh, looking at and thinking about and discussing uh, what it means to be writing uh, online, what it means to be composing in digital spaces. Uh, it was a very interesting event. We looked at a lot of student work and there were teachers there, there were researchers there, there were uh, business folks there. It was just a, a, a good mix of people talking about all these sorts of, of things that were emerging and we looked at a lot of student work. Uh, I remember saying during the event that uh, this felt like a, uh, the beginning of an explosion of writing and composing and making. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that word making in a minute. But uh, I also noticed at that event that so much of the, the work that was really interesting that I was seeing uh, at this event was happening not in the classroom, but near the classroom. It was happening in after school clubs or uh, after school care, uh, community centers, museums, uh, uh, classrooms after the, the lights had been turned out and folks had gone home for the day. Uh, I thought that was really interesting and, and I started to wonder about uh, what the role of school was in situations like these, in these types of, of learning situations. Are schools the, the ceiling uh, of, of uh, learning and, and is our work with standards uh, the, the ceiling of what we should expect from kids or is that the floor uh, and, and we use our time with students not just to to work towards those standards, but to, to work from those standards into uh, those bits of interestingness that I, I saw in places like uh, Digital Is. Uh, and it really, really got me thinking about learning and, and its place in a school. Uh, about that same time, I was introduced to the work of the uh, Digital Media and Learning Group. Uh, it's a group studying uh, learning in all sorts of places, not just schools, but uh, in the community. And. Uh, what happens when when learning happens at school and not at school and what are what are learners doing right now they've uh, since released some principles they call them the connect and learning principles that lay out uh, the six things that they think are essential for for good connected learning they talk about production centeredness uh, that you're making stuff uh, that it's interest driven that it, it comes from a place of shared purpose that peer culture is very much a part of of connected learning that it's openly networked and, and also that it's academic and important and uh, I left uh, that conference uh, wondering about uh, those uh, those types of folks and learning and, and school and places like that. And, and I came home to my uh, school district and around that same time a colleague of mine and I were rethinking what it meant to do professional development uh, for uh, the teachers that we work with. We were, uh, we were certain that the one-shot classes that we were offering weren't beneficial. They were um, folks uh, just beginning to scratch the surface of an idea and then leaving. They were uh, four hours or eight hours of, of here's, how the, here's how the mouse works or here's how Word works and uh, we didn't like that as a model for learning about technology uh, specifically but in general uh, learning at all. And from there we uh, developed what we call the Digital Learning Collaborative and that became a, a project where we help folks work through two years of learning about technology. That first year uh, is just a year for them to learn and explore in a team of, of committed folks to think about a, a piece of technology or to dig in and try it out with an emphasis not on teaching it to students or using it in the classroom but just figuring out what it's about and what it means. Uh, and then in year two we ask our uh, teachers in the DLC to go through a teacher research process to apply what they learned in their learning year into their classrooms and to pay very close attention to what happens when they do that. Um, this was this was hard learning for folks to do. It was a very different model of professional development uh, to spend a year uh, exploring something, to not be told all of the uh, answers to the questions that might come up, to help them figure out how to figure out uh, what those uh, uh, answers might be and where they might find them. Uh, and it took a it took a special sort of teacher to uh, be successful there. Uh, and and I say that saying meaning that. Um, 
I think most teachers are, are capable of this work, but there was something present in some of our successful teams that, that seemed to be missing in some of our teams that we would say weren't as successful or that really struggled in this process. Um, Paul Tuff would call this grit. Uh, as we thought about it, we realized that it was really uh, about agency, about this sense of, of understanding uh, that, that one was in control of their own learning situation to some degree, uh, even amidst constraint and, and culture and, and obstacles and things. Um, more on that in a second. I mentioned uh, the connected learning uh, work, and uh, in March I had the opportunity to hear uh, Rafi Santos speak uh, in a very short presentation about um, why kids need to know how to hack. And he put some language around some ideas that I'd had for quite a while about why uh, tinkering and fiddling and playing are, are really important. And uh, couple that with this uh, conversation about agency that Michelle and I were having in our school district, along with our colleague Kyle Addington, and uh, the notions of connected learning, uh, and and some of the really interesting work that was emerging from from that research and ideas, um, we realized that that we wanted hacking to have a place in our school district uh, to some degree. So we we brainstormed what a a four day hack the curriculum session might look like. Uh, as we as we as we tried to figure out what that could look like, we realized that this wasn't a, another class. This wasn't an opportunity to uh, teach just one thing one time. We realized that these notions of agency and hacking and, and uh, making, as I mentioned earlier, composing. These were really essential, and thus the, uh, the Center for Make, Hack, Play was born. Uh, so let's, let's talk about these lenses, and uh, we're not uh, certain of many things here, but we do know that these are important, and I just want to uh, blow these up for you and uh, hopefully help you to be thinking about where making and hacking and playing make sense to you and your work. So to make means to give certain properties to something, to cause, to be, or to become, to compose or represent. Uh, making is writing, uh, and, and making is composing, and making is building things. We are, we are creators, and the maker movement uh, has, has really emphasized some of these elements. Making uh, brush bots, for example, or making websites. Mozilla is doing some really interesting work in helping people think about what it means to not only consume the web, but to make the web. Uh, and recognize that the web is, is made of people. Makers on television, like Mythbusters, will, will show you that uh, gadgets and circuits are great. The Maker uh, Education Initiative is an I idea uh, suited to, to making kids into makers. These are important ideas, um, but they're not just about the circuits. Uh, makers don't just make uh, technology. Um, it, it's about the actual making. Uh, my children uh, when they paint and draw and write and build things are, are makers in that same sense and uh, making isn't just about electronics it's about any act of creation we know that creation uh, comes from uh, it, its synthesis and it involves higher order thinking and taking knowledge and, and being aware of what's come before uh, and, and that leads us to actually to hacking which is uh, improving a system, not necessarily building something new, but fiddling with something that's already there. Most of the making that we do is really hacking. We, we uh, write a poem that's hacking language that's been uh, used before, or uh, taking our feelings and experiences and putting them together. Uh, these, this sort of tinkering uh, often is expressed in, in code, you know, uh, and, and when you say hack in a school environment, uh, sometimes folks get a little nervous. We're not talking about folks uh, who are breaking things or destroying things. We're talking about the original sense of hacking as a definition, improving a system, making it better, fiddling with what's there uh, to make it great. But that's not just about code. Um, you know, we hack the, the classroom spaces that we find ourselves in. Uh, we, we, as hackers, begin to believe that we can influence what we're working with and that we have agency in whatever system we find ourselves in. And it requires a deep knowledge of the system and of the structure and of the culture of the thing that you're hacking in order to do this well. Just like making a birdhouse requires extensive knowledge of, of woodworking and tools and math and measurement uh, and the needs of birds. Um, so too hacking requires that you understand the, the parts and the pieces that you're taking apart and putting back together. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, what does it mean to hack our classrooms? Uh, the third teacher and other uh, folks have done great work to help us think about redesigning the spaces that we learn in uh, to, to make them more beneficial to learning. But what does hacking the textbook look like? 
what does it look like when we take the book and, and through the use of OER and other things, um, really start to fiddle with this notion of the book of stuff uh, of learning? Um, what, what does hacking our curriculum look like? How might we hack school? These are questions that we're openly wondering about. In fact, we were asked very specifically uh, as a result of some of our teacher research in our school district to, to explore this question of how do you make school feel less like school? So we're engaged in some teacher research work around that. Uh, and that's a hacking project. Uh, lastly, let's talk about play. Play is a, a, a multi definition word, but in our sense, uh, of course, we mean the elements of fun. But I, I think this notion of play as the removal of constraints or the, the movement or space for movement, uh, a state in which action is feasible, these are, these are definitions of play that don't usually get, pardon the pun, play. But they're just as important. Um, when you are able to play in a system, it means that you feel freedom, even though there might not be much of it, but you found it, and you, you're figuring out how to fiddle. That, that freedom can lead to hacking and fiddling with uh, the system. It can lead to creation, too, because you understand the constraints and the limits, and you're able to make something happen uh, within those. Uh, improv is a great uh, playground for thinking about play. We, we like to uh, use the, the techniques and, and tools and language of improv when we talk about play. Um, inviting people in to play with you. Uh, yes and thinking. These are, these are important elements of a playful uh, learning environment, and they're essential. Uh, so when we think about how can we make school not like school, we want to set a high bar for learning. Uh, we don't believe that the standards and the, and the core instructional work of an educational system are the ceiling. That's the floor, and there's lots to build on. Ultimately, we want all of our students to reach a place of agency. We want our teachers to be there, too. We believe that active agents are better learners. They are more thoughtful learners. They are more capable learners, and they learn much more interesting things, and they're really going to make an impact in whatever system they happen to find themselves in. So those are the lenses of hacking, making, and playing. We hope that you are uh, exploring these ideas, and we'd be very interested in learning uh, more about what you are uh, learning as you go. I hope uh, that you uh, are, are thinking about how you might apply the lenses of make, hack, and play in your work. Uh, but specifically, what are the constraints that you face in your teaching or in your work? How might you fiddle or create your way through or around those constraints in order to affect change or to improve outcomes for your students or to improve opportunities? And then where are the moments of creation and play in your learning? It's oftentimes really uh, easy to forget uh, about the importance of, of making something, to, of using your hands uh, to express a concept over uh, necessarily taking in all the time. Uh, and then where are you being playful? Where is, where is the freedom for your students to move in your systems and how are they moving? Uh, those are just three of the many questions we're trying to better understand and explore uh, here at the Center for Make Hack Play. Just three of many questions you might ask yourself as you're thinking about how to apply these lenses and where they fit for you. Uh, you can learn more about Make Hack Play at makehackplay.org. We hope you enjoy the rest of the K-12 online conference. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the internet.